Well, good morning once again, everybody. We also want to welcome everyone that might be online right now as well. We welcome you and those maybe watch later on. Hey, we're in a series called It Is Written, and we're talking about the Bible and how we can understand the Bible. And a lot of folks say, yeah, I, I think the Bible's awesome. I think it's fantastic, and I would like to read the Bible. Oh, yeah, I, I think the Bible's awesome. I think it's great. But how often do we open the Bible and we find ourselves not understanding what we're reading, wondering, can we really trust this thing? There's a bunch of things that a bunch of men put together and put their hands all over it. And how are we supposed to trust the Bible? You know, come on, we've evolved. I mean, we don't really know sometimes what to do. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've gone through it. Or maybe you're like me. And maybe you sat down and you, you said, okay, let me read the Bible. And you start in the beginning of the year. I'm excited. I'm going to read through the Bible in a year. And you get through Genesis, which is kind of fun. And all of a sudden you get to Exodus and you're sitting there and you're, and you're, and you're reading it. And, um, and you say, okay, let me read this. You get up in the morning, you read this, and you go, uh, Exodus 28, verse 15. And you shall make a breastpiece of judgment, the work of skillful workmen, like the work of an ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, and purple. No. And you shall make a breastplate of... Uh, and you're like, am I the only one that's ever happened to? And you read the same sentence like four or five times. You're like, I don't get this thing. How do you like the, I love the Bible. I don't understand a word it says, but I love it. I think it's fantastic, but you don't understand it. You're like, I, it's too complicated. I know I'm supposed to like it. I know, but man, I can't understand it. And frankly, how do you trust the Bible? And so what we've been doing is going through it. In fact, the last two weeks in particular, we've been spending time of looking in the Gospels. How can you trust the Gospels? How can you trust the Old Testament? And today what we're going to be talking about is how do you understand the Bible? And so we want to help you guys to be able to do that because it's not rocket science. It's not something that's a mystery. In fact, we really want to help you understand. And so the biggest premise we've been having through this entire process of this series has been the following. We've been saying this, that the most powerful source in the universe and every realm is the Word of God. We believe it's the Word of God and that Jesus is the Word and the foundation of all things. And it says in Colossians 1.16, it says, For by him, that's Jesus, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him. All right? And it also says, as we continue on, and he is before all things. That means he's before anything that ever was. And God spoke and it became. And in him, can you say this together? All things hold together in him. He holds it all together. And we've been talking about, even science says, there's something that holds the universe together. We don't know what it is, dark matter, whatever you want to call it. The Bible says that Jesus holds it all together. Jesus holds it together. Isn't it amazing that science now talks about it, and yet it, it, that's about it? Well, one of the things that Jesus said was this. He said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts him into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. So Jesus is talking about how to be wise and how to be foolish. And he talked about the wise man. And so what happened is, he's saying if you listen to these words, a lot of folks just think because they can recite the Bible, it's good enough. He's saying if you listen to these words and you do what it says, you're building yourself on the rock. And that rock is something that will not fail when storms come. But if you only hear the word of God and do not do what it says, what happens is you keep putting, taking, putting cracks in your foundation. And so that begins to happen. If your foundation shifts or you begin to remove blocks from it, all of a sudden the house will be off. The walls will begin to crack and eventually it will come down. My friends, what's been happening in our culture, what's happening in a lot of our lives, well, I don't believe that in the Bible. And we stop standing on the word of God. As a result of that, we see society falling apart, lies falling apart. People are choosing what to believe and what not to believe, and they're treating this like a buffet line. But the Bible says that this is the Word of God. Well, how do we know that? Again, I encourage you to go to the last two weeks where we talk about that. Today's primary function is to help us to understand the Bible. How do you understand the Bible? Is it just for the select few? No, it's not. It's for everybody. It really is. It's for everybody. You can learn to understand the Bible. So today what we're going to do is look at how the Bible is put together so you have a better understanding. For example, how many of you like when you get new updates on your computer? 
Windows up the operating system, and then you have to learn the whole thing over again. Oh, the new iPhone has new IS, ISO update. iOS, thank you, sir. I, I have my proof text over here. iOS, I apologize for not getting it right. So that's why I need Jesus and I need my son. So anyhow, they do, they, they do it, and you're like, I can't figure this out. And you're frustrated, right? But once you understand the new operating system, what happens? Wow, this is actually good. This, this is actually better than it was before. And so what happens is if you and I will understand how this operating system works, it's not a mystery. It's available for everybody. So I want to encourage you, the more you understand the Bible, the more you will enjoy it. You see, we read the Bible not to know about God, but to know God himself. My friends, that's the goal. The goal is not to know more information about God, but the goal is to know God, spend time with God. And let me make you a little promise here. The Bible says, if you will seek me with all your heart, you will find me. I want to challenge you to take, a, to take a, uh, an experiment with me. I want to challenge you to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to open your eyes. Say, God, would you open my eyes? God, I want to fall more in love with you, and I want to understand your word. Ask him that, and guess what will happen? He'll do it. Oh, come on, how can you say that? The Bible says, if you search with me with all your heart, you will find me. If you pray anything according to my will, I will do it. This is the will of the Lord, that you would come to know God more and more and more. And he wants to reveal himself to you. And one of the primary ways he does it is through his word, through the Bible. Okay? So I want to encourage you with that. So, so we read the Bible not to know about God, but to know God. And the Bible is a love story about working through people's lives. This is what God does. You know what the word Bible means? Biblia, okay? The word Bible actually means book. In the Greek, it's called Biblia. And uh, it's actually the Greek word, and it comes from the place, there's a Greek city in Lebanon. It was called Biblos, and it was a place where they manufactured books of their day. They took papyrus, which is a plant, and they'd stretch it out and glue it together, and they'd write on it. It'd be like a parchment, if you will. It'd be like the paper of their day, and that's what they did. So the, actually, the word biblios actually means book. So the Bible actually means book. <laughs> okay, so that's it. So this is called a book. That's what the Bible's called, book. But it's actually called big B, book. And we like to say it's basic instructions before leaving earth. It's an owner's manual. It's a love letter. It helps us to understand how we are to live our life. It's absolutely supernatural. It's incredible because the Bible was written over 1,600 years in a dozen countries on three continents from people from all walks of life. This is what's so amazing. 1,600 years it was written. You know the Quran was written by one person in 23 years? Do you realize that Confucius was uh, written in 30 years. Buddha was written by one person. And so you have all these people, right? The Bible was written 1,600 years. You know what that's like, everybody? Imagine, if you will, for a few moments, imagine going back to 400 A.D. till now. That's 1,600 years. Isn't that incredible? It was written over that span of time. And amazingly enough, it agrees. In fact, the people involved, you have poets, you have prophets, Princes, kings, sailors, soldiers, attorneys, yes, attorneys, doctors, farmers, scholars, shepherds, priests, historians, fishermen, tax collectors, which were the hated ones, and businessmen. And people wrote them in the most unlikely places, for example, in caves, in ships, homes, palaces, prisons, and the very desert. It was written over 1,600 years, 40 different authors, yet it agrees the Bible agrees with itself. It's absolutely astounding how it works together, how the prophetic word comes out. We talked about the over 300 prophecies of Christ alone and over 1,000 prophecies about the end times. It's incredible when you read about the word of God. So there are 40 writers, but only one author. And who is that author? That author is God. This is what the Bible has to say. All Scripture, the Apostle Paul writing here, all Scripture is breathed out by God. A lot of folks say, well, I only believe in the red, I'm a red-letter Christian, which sounds really noble. In other words, I only read the red letters of Jesus and follow that. Problem is, Jesus did not follow that. 
There's nothing wrong with red letter Bibles that have red letters in them. But all scripture, Jesus talks about all scripture. Jesus quotes scripture. Jesus believes scripture. Jesus, actually, every time he came into contact with the enemy, he would quote scripture. That was his defense. So you and I, it's a powerful thing. The Bible says all scripture is breathed, pneuma, out by God, and profitable for what? For teaching, reproof, for correction, for training, and righteousness. What's righteousness? It sounds so like righteous. Not the Righteous Brothers, which was a musical group, but righteousness simply means right. Don't you like to have your food right? Right? You like when your team is right? Wouldn't it be nice if the Yankees won last night? That'd be right. So right just means doing things right. That's a great thing, right? Right. No pun intended. Training in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be complete. How many want to be complete? I do. Equipped for every good work. The Bible will do that for us. It will tell you. It might not tell you how to make a cheeseburger, but it will tell you how to do it with the right integrity. The Bible may not tell you how to be a lawyer, but it will tell you how to, to do your work unto the Lord. So the Bible is amazing. It's a actual words of God that he speaks to us through inspiration. This is what Jesus says. He says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh has no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are pneuma, which is spirit, breath, and life. That's what Jesus says. I want to encourage you that sometimes it's hard to understand all these things and understand the context, but if you understand the context, it really helps. There is a great resource. I highly encourage you to take this down, to take a picture of it or whatever. It's called, it's called thebibleproject.com. It's fantastic. A bunch of scholars got together, artists, um, graphic artists got together, and they put this together. I'm going to show you a little clip of how this can be, help you in your study of the Bible. The Bible is one of the most influential books of all time, but what is it exactly? Yeah, some people treat the Bible like a divine behavior manual that dropped out of heaven. Others use it like a theology dictionary, written to answer all of our questions about God. And others still think of it like a grab bag of spiritual one-liners and inspiring stories. But here's the thing. The Bible isn't written as a rule book or a theology dictionary or even as a collection of inspirational writings. Then what is the Bible? Well, open up the Bible to page one and read the opening words. In the beginning. Now, turn to the last chapter of the Bible where you can read this. And they reigned forever and ever. Okay, so the Bible's telling a story from beginning to end. Yeah, it's one epic narrative about how God has appointed humanity as his partners to oversee this amazing world. It's about how we've ruined that partnership and how God is restoring us and our world through Jesus. Okay, one story, but there's a lot going on. Many plots, many characters, all written in many different books. But once you see how every book has a careful literary design, you won't get lost. And you can see how it fits into the overall storyline. There are also important repeated themes that weave through the entire biblical story. Yeah, like the covenants that God makes with people. Or the hope for a human who will confront evil. Or how God's justice will one day make all things right. And every theme culminates in the story of Jesus. There are also a lot of strange words in the Bible, words we don't use in normal language. But when we take time to understand them, we discover profound ideas that contribute to the overall biblical story. So it takes work to know how to read the different types of literature in the Bible. But once you do learn how, you'll discover that the Bible is a work of literary genius that can transform how you live and how you think about everything. So that's what The Bible Project is all about, to help people see the Bible as one unified story that leads to Jesus. All right. Very helpful, everybody. And I really encourage you that they have it for every book of the Bible. And you can, like, when you read the book of Judges, for example, you can watch the video. It will help you a little bit. There's things written about it. And this is from a trusted source. Very well done. And, and you know, never in the history of man have we had so many tools to help us to understand the Bible. And we have them all at our fingertips. I highly encourage you to invest in time of this. And we even have a class right now, I have a small group called How to Understand the Bible that Pastor Rich is doing. We're offering these types of things to help you grow, to become self 
sustaining believers, our objective is to help you come to know God and to help be able to take care of yourself. In other words, to know how to open the word of God for yourself, how to get something out of it, and not have to rely upon a pastor or a podcast or a radio station, but something you can do your own. And this is something that everyone can do, at least most people can. And so I want to encourage you with that. So let's move forward. The Bible, by the way, as we look at the Bible, how's the Bible put together? It's important to understand how it's put together. Okay, number one, the Bible is not written in chronological order. I didn't realize that. I used to think, okay, you read the beginning, you start in the beginning, you go all the way to the maps, and that's the Bible. No, the Bible is not in chronological order. It's put in different sections. In fact, the Bible is like a library of life. If you go to the library, and, and if you go to the poetry section, it's not going to help you know how to fix your sink. Why are you going to read about poetry to fix your sink? Right? If you want to know how to do it, you go to YouTube. Okay. Now, you would go to the area of self-help and how to do home improvements. You go to a place where you could get books and manuals, right? That's where you want to go. So, and how you read different sections is how you interpret it. So you don't interpret poetry. Let's go ahead and look at the different types of sections in the Bible. First of all, we have the overview. The law is the first five books of the Old Testament, and that's Genesis through Deuteronomy. It's called the Book of Moses. And primarily there, it talks about the law and how God set things up. Now, I want to stop here just for a moment to help us to understand. A lot of people say this to me. Well, you say you believe in the Bible, but you don't follow what it says. Because after all, the Bible says you're not supposed to have shellfish. And you're not supposed to have two, two different types of, of clothing or of yarn put together. So you guys don't pay attention to that, and now you're telling me how to live my life and who I can do this and who I can marry and, who, and what it means to be a man or woman. Who, who are you to say these things? But you see, we need to understand a few things about the Bible, the law. There are three types of biblical law in the Old Testament that we need to understand. We talked about this in our series in the Ten Commandments. The first one is ceremonial law. And ceremonial law is how to cut the lamb, how to fill the tank up with water, how to turn the lights on, how to run the projection uh, for our day. In their day, it would be how, what the priests are supposed to do, how you're supposed to set up the sacrifice. That's called ceremonial law. And ceremonial law applies only to the people at that time. It's, it, that can change. So you have ceremonial law. The next one you have is something called civil law. Civil law is the governing the governing, the best, their, their constitution, if you will. And think about it. There were nomadic people living in the middle of the desert who were enslaved for over 400 years. God gave them a government system, and they'd run by that. That civil law can change. So ceremonial law changes. Civil law changes. However, there's one law that does not change. That's called moral law. Moral laws do not kill, do not lie. And moral law is found in the Ten Commandments. Okay, everybody? So... You got to be careful. People say that. It's not really true. What kind of law are we talking about? I hope that helps you just a little bit. So we had the five books of the Old Testament, excuse me, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Then we had the historical books of the Bible primarily. And you can find that through Joshua through Esther. And Joshua starts with the conquest of the promised land and how they eventually go Go into the book of Judges where every man does what's right in his own eyes. Then the people say, we want to be like the rest of the world. We want to have kings. So God gives them Saul, David, Solomon. And then after that, there's a divided kingdom. And then eventually, you have, a, you have Israel and you have Judah. And then they come to captivity, the Babylonians. And then the Persians. And then finally, the Greeks. And then the Romans. And all this happens in history. And the amazing part about it, the Bible prophesies these things ahead of time. In fact, the book of Daniel talks about Alexander the Great. It doesn't mention Alexander the Great, but when you read it, you're like, oh my goodness. It actually describes it. Remember last week, it even talks about when Christ is going to come to the very segment of time. It's amazing. So you have the history, 12 books. And Esther, by the way, is the last book written in the Old Testament, chronologically speaking. Xerxes is the king at the time. So let's move forward. Then we have the poetic books, the five books, Job through the Song of Solomon. And so how do you read the Song of Solomon? How do you read the, the Psalms? How do you read that? For example, I could say, I love Sandra. Sandra is in my heart. Now, is my wife Sandra literally in my heart? Of course not. But what I'm basically saying is that she's in my heart, that I love her so much, that she's a part of me. 
You know, and my, my heart beats for my wife. Thank you. Praise the Lord. That's good preaching, everybody. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so you have, you have poetic books, right? And then you also have, for example, let me, let me share something else with you. There's a lot of believers that beat themselves up because of scriptures. For example, the Bible says in Proverbs, train up a child in the way that it should go. And when the child's old, it will not depart. People read that like a law. It's not a law. It's a principle. How can you say that? Well, if that's the case, then God is an illegitimate parent. Because who did he have? Adam and Eve. What did Adam and Eve do? Rebelled, right? So you see that, everybody. Now, if God gives you a word and says, this is for your family, take it and make it yours, that's different. But to punish yourself because your child walks out on the Lord is not fair. And so to take the, uh, a proverb and make it a law, it's not supposed to be a law, it's a principle. That often work. Does that make sense, everybody? I hope you understand that. Because a lot of people beat themselves up because things don't happen as they would see. So you have, pro you have the uh, poetical books. Then you also have prophetical books. There's 17 books in, in prophecy. You have the five major prophets, Isaiah. You have Isaiah through Daniel. These are the major prophets. In fact, Daniel, I mentioned already how he prophesied these things before they even happened. So you have Daniel, you have the minor prophets. There's 12 minor prophets, not because they're less important, because the books are smaller, okay? I know, I know. So there's 12 minor prophets, Hosea through Malachi. Then you come to a point of 400, we call it silent years. And this is the years that Daniel talks about, isn't it amazing? We talked about Alexander the Great, the Greeks, the Romans, the rebuilding of the temple, under occupation of the Roman people, sacrificial worship begins again. All these things were prophesied in the Bible, and they come, and then there comes the Messiah. So we had the silent years. We have even Hanukkah took place during this time, and Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. It was not in the Bible, but it's something history that happened in history. Now we come to the Gospels, the New Testament, and we have four books called the Gospel. We call the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic means similar, and those are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're similar in structure and how they do it. John is a different type of work. It's more thematic in its presentation. All four Gospels tell the life of Jesus Christ, and they tell it from a different angle, but the same truth. For example, today we watch baptisms. And some people said, oh, yeah, the guys came up. They, took, they put this railing in here. They took the top off and put it over here. Okay? And some others would say, yeah, they, they came into the water and they got baptized. They won't mention anything, anything about the top being taken off or the railing. Ah, see, you can't trust it. No. They were baptized. And so the Bible shares four different perspectives, all revealing the same theological truth. All the theology agrees together miraculously. So that's the Gospels. You have the four Gospels. Then you have something else in the Bible called epistles. Now, what are epistles? Epistles, well, first we go to Acts. There's history, okay? Acts is history. So you have, you have the Gospels, and then you have the history, and it's written by Luke, and it talks about the early church. After Christ rose again from the dead and went into heaven, the early church began. Starts off in the upper room with Peter. Then it transitions from Peter to the apostle Paul primarily, and it talks about the expansion of the church, about a 40 year or so history of the church and what happened in the early church. It's like the highlight reel of the early church. Then we come to the epistles, and these are 21 books that are letters. 13 of the 21 books are the Apostle Paul, which are the longest letters. You have Peter, you have Paul, you don't have Mary, by the way. It's a nice, nice folk group. And then you have Jude, uh, you have uh, First and Second Peter, Philemon. You have all these different books, and these are letters written to a specific people for a specific purpose. And what I find so encouraging about the letters in the New Testament is they're written to a troubled church. People often say to me, well, we need to get back to the early church. My friends, the early church were full of people like you and me. And if you want to see a screwed up church, look at 1 Corinthians. The stuff that was going on in that church was horrific. And the Bible, the Apostle Paul, they deal with these little issues and big issues. And because they had issues... We, we, have this, we can deal with stuff in our own churches today. There's nothing new under the sun when it comes to human, the human heart. And so these letters, divinely inspired by God, are become scripture. And even Peter said, he says, the scriptures are hard to understand. People even twist the apostle Paul's writings. 
So even Peter calls Paul's writings scripture. Amazing. Amazing. And again, I just want to encourage you, if you not, we're not here, go to the last two weeks, cornerstonecheshire.com, where we dealt, how do you know these are truly the word of God? What about the other gospels? We dealt with some of those topics in the last couple of weeks, all right? So that you can go back to those uh, resources. Then finally, we have another section. It's Revelation, prophecy, the last days and eternity. eternity. Apocalyptic type of literature, the end. In the book of Revelation, a lot of people look at the book of Revelation like a secret code book. If we can break the code, it's like, almost like trying to open a safe. If I can figure out the combination, I'll be able to open up all the new things. And that's not the purpose of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ primarily. It's to show Jesus. Also, it was written by the only apostle who was not killed, not martyred, is John. And the and, and purpose of John was to encourage a persecuted church at the time. Because the church at the time was under the persecution of the Emperor Nero. Nero was a horrific man. People, thunk, people think he went out of his mind from lead poisoning. We're not quite sure. He used to drink water out of lead pipes back in those days. And the ladies used to put on lead makeup on their eyes. A lot of people went insane. But we don't know what happened to Nero, but he was a madman. What he did is there was a fire in Rome, and he blamed it on the Christians. He began to persecute them. He began to even dip them in tar and light them on fire for candles. Okay, this is the kind of stuff that was going on. So John is writing at the latter part of his old man, writing these letters to the church to encourage them about how to deal with persecution. So it actually describes what's going on, and then it describes what's going to happen at the end, prophetically. But the purpose of it is that you would know Jesus Christ, not secret codes. Let me just say something else about the second coming of Christ. The church, quote unquote, the Jewish people, that was the church of their day, thought they knew how the Messiah was going to come. And Jesus came differently than they thought, and they persecuted him. Even the demons didn't get it. If the enemy would have known that Jesus was going to die on the cross like he did, they wouldn't have played along. So, that be the case. Do you think maybe the second coming of Christ is going to be a little bit different than we think? I sometimes I think that God's in heaven and says, oh, go, go to that pastor again. He's got all those charts. How do we, go, how do we come back again? Sorry, folks. I, I, know, I know it's nice. It makes you feel good. If I can tell you, this is what happens. Boom, boom, boom. You'll like it. You'll feel secure. Just follow Jesus. It's going to happen. Look at the main sources of prophecy that are clear and undisputed, and it gives you enough information to know. Okay? So you have Revelation. Now, what's the plot of the Bible? I want to show you the mirror image. It's amazing how the Bible works. Amazing. Next week, we'll talk a little bit about Isaiah, how that's a mirror of the Bible as well. But before we do that, let's look at, if you can see, it's kind of small, um, but we're going to talk about the themes of the Bible, what happened. First of all, in the book of Genesis, we have God and righteous man. Man was right in paradise, right? They were perfect. They were in paradise with God. They were working with God. They were doing great things. Then... Satan and sin entered. Man chose to rebel against mankind. They were thrown out of the garden. Perfection was gone. The earth was cursed at that point, right? Man got worse and worse and worse. He had the first murder. They began to multiply. The next thing you know, the earth got so wicked that every thought and intention of the heart was evil at all times. And so God brought a great flood and destroyed the world at that time, okay? And so he started over again. And what happened? They began to gather together. God said, go throughout the earth and, and populate and propagate, all that. But they didn't do that. They gathered in one place. They became one government, one language. And they worked together and said, we will be like God. What do we hear today? We will what? We'll be like God. The government's your God. The government is my shepherd. I shall not want. Right? And it's all about government. It's about people. It's about trusting it. The one world government system had began to happen. And God said, nope, going to change that and scattered them. Then we have God taking a man by the name of Abram from Ur who came and God dis displayed his grace and his love through a faithful man called Abraham. And we are all sons and daughters of Abraham if you're a believer in Christ Jesus. So we eventually have the 12 tribes and then we have Israel. 
Okay? Then we have the whole system where you had the kings, and then you had the dividing kingdom, and then you had the captivity, okay? And then you have Jesus Christ comes on the scene. Now, look at the mirror image here. For our sake, the Bible says, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Man tried through laws and rules, and it could not be made right. Christ was the one that did it all right for us, paid the price for us, became sin for us that we could know the righteousness of God. And look at how it works here. You have the 12 tribes of Israel, God's holy people. You have the 12 disciples, church, God's holy people. That's how it started off, right? You have the 12 tribes, and then for expand. You have the 12 disciples, and expand it. You have one world government system, where we have, come on, it's gonna happen. One world government system. You can see it happening right now. There's a great tension. We don't want national sovereignty anymore. We want, we want all the world to become one. And it makes a lot of sense. There's enough food on the planet where no one has to starve. There's enough uh, equity on the planet that no one has to be poor. But because of the selfishness and the evilness of man, people are suffering. Therefore, we need a, a world leader that will put it all in line so none of us have to suffer anymore. It makes sense. The problem is man doesn't have the capacity to have that kind of power. And so it's going to happen, everybody. You can see it happening already. All it takes is a couple of cataclysmic natural disasters and some wars. And people, they'll do whatever you ask them to do. If they don't have food and shelter, they'll do what you say. My friends, the Bible talks about it. In one world government, there'll be a 666, the mark of the beast, that is the economic system. It's the economy, stupid, as people would say. It's all about the economy. That becomes the worship of our culture. It sets us up to worship the beast. Let me say something. I didn't say any other service. You guys are special. That if you begin to worship materialism, and it's all about gathering things and getting money and living beyond your means and trying to get more and more materialism, you know what that is? That's the God of mammon. That's the God of the economic system. And if you get caught in that, it begins to control you. Now, your bills control you instead of you controlling your bills because we're living beyond our means. And that sets us up to be taken over by a world leader who say, I'll make it all perfect. It would not take much, everybody, to happen. One world government is not far behind. Then we also see this. The world is judged and destroyed. The world will be judged and destroyed. First time it was water. Second time it will be fire. What will happen to the church? Come next week, I'll tell you. Okay. Then we have Satan and sin enter. Praise God. Satan and sin exit. And finally, God God in righteousness, man in paradise. God in redeemed man in paradise. No more sickness, no more suffering. There is a longing in the human heart for perfection. You would not have a longing for perfection if it did not exist one day. You were designed by God for perfection. You were designed to have a relationship with God. You were designed to rule and reign with God. And because it's broken, something in us is something's not right. But finally, it will all be put in the right way. It's an amazing thing. That's the basic structure of the Bible. That's the mirror image you can see through Christ, the New Testament, and the Old Testament. Now, what's the whole subject of the Bible? What's it all about? It's about love, right? All you need is love. Da, 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 da. Okay, sorry. No, the subject is Jesus. The subject is all about Jesus. Look what Jesus says to the disciples, I'm sorry, the Pharisees and the religious leaders of his day. He says this. You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. This is a sign to find Jesus. It points you to Jesus. Now, some of you, if I gave you directions, I want you to come to Cheshire. And you're driving an Interstate 84, and it says exit 26, Cheshire. And you, you, you put your hazards on, you slam your brakes on, you pull over, and you go right to the sign. We found Cheshire. That's not Cheshire. That's only a sign that points you to Cheshire. The Bible is supposed to point you to Jesus if you're not going to Jesus, you're stopping at the sign instead of your Savior. 
That's the purpose of Scripture, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible without Jesus is dangerous. The Bible without a relationship with Jesus Christ is dangerous. It becomes legalism. But through Christ, it's powerful. They point to me. For example, the subject is Jesus. You can see it throughout Scripture. For example, Jesus in creation. In Genesis 1, let us make man in our, our plural image. We see in 1 John, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the Word. We see Abraham and Isaac sacrifice. And he says, God will provide the lamb. What happened was this. It's an amazing story. That God challenged Abraham. Back in those days, child sacrifice was not uncommon. I know it's horrible. By the way, we do today too. God of Moloch, we have the God of Moloch today as well. But what do they do it for? For crops? For blessing? What do we do it for? Convenience? And, you know, listen, and if you've made that choice, there's forgiveness and there is healing. Amen. Please understand that. I might just, if you, if, if you want to be condemned, go to a different church. We're not about condemnation. We're about conviction. But we must deal with the truth. We had a stuff going on today. It's a little more sophisticated than it was in those days. A little more clean. So God told Abraham, Abraham at the time, I want you to take Isaac, the son of promise. I want you to climb a hill. I want you to put wood on his back. Isaac took the wood and climbed Mount Moriah. You know where Mount Moriah is today? It's the Temple Mount. It's where the temple was built. Today in Israel, you can go and see it. Mount Moriah. So Isaac brought it up to the hill, made the sacrifice, and said to his father, Father, here's the wood. Here's the stone. But where is the sacrifice? Abraham says, Abraham says God will provide the lamb. And then what happens? There's a ram caught in a thicket. And what happened 2,000, not quite, 1,000 years later, what happened then? There's a man by the name of Jesus, the Son of God, took the wood on his back from his father, climbed Mount Moriah, laid down his life, and became the sacrifice for your sin and my sin. He took our place. That's Abraham and Isaac's sacrifice. How it is a mirror of what Christ was, it all fits together. Even the numbers fit together. That's for next week. I'm just kidding. Okay. Then we have Psalm 22 talks about crucifixion. You can read it. And perhaps one of the most vivid is Isaiah 53. You read the prophets talking about Jesus. You read Isaiah 53, Psalm 22 and there's other places in scripture. We have Daniel, the fourth man in the fire. It's Jesus. So the subject is Jesus. Now what's the direct object? Is us. The subject is Jesus, the direct object. What happens is for us. Now the question is this, why? Why did God do all of this for us? Because of agape, it's called love. And the beautiful thing is God does not give us love. He gives himself, which is love. He doesn't give peace, he gives himself, which is peace. He's the essence. He is the source of every good and perfect gift comes from him. All love, all peace, all joy. He doesn't give you a thing. He gives you himself. If you and I run after love without Jesus, you're running after an attribute from somebody else or another circumstance. But if you go after God, you get love. If you go after God, you get peace. You go after God, you get purpose. You go after God, you get healing. He is the source of every good and perfect thing. It comes from God himself through Jesus Christ, who's the access point, who's the interface for you and I to plug into God, to have a relationship with him that we're not valid on our own. There had to be someone to go in our place. Why? Because God so loved that he gave the verb. We had the subject is Jesus, direct object is us. The why is love, the verb is give. For God so loved us that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. Did we read this? For those of us that are in a church a long time, yeah, yeah, John 3, 16. Maybe this is brand new for you. We should go to scripture as if it's our first time every time. Don't go there glibly like you know it already. He gave because he loved us. And 1 John 3, 16 says this, we know 
what real love is. Don't you want to know real love? Oh, baby, I love you. Yeah, sure you do. I love you. I'll love you. I'll never leave you. And then they gave you divorce papers. Right? How many are tired of empty promises of love? Baby, I love you. Give me what I want. If you do this, then I'll love you. Nope. You know what God says? If you surrender. I love you just the way you are. But I will not force you. You have to surrender. You don't have to be perfect. We know what real love is. My friends, real love is God. Real love expressed is Jesus Christ himself. Because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. We're not saved. We don't become believers so we can gather more things. Jesus is not the American dream expressed. He's not some kind of mechanism to help us get what we want. Jesus is not that. Jesus is life. Jesus is love. Jesus is purpose. Purpose. And my friends, if you and I do not live for him, we live for ourselves. If we live for ourselves, it's vanity. If you live for Christ, it's both here and now and forevermore. We know what real love is because he, Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and our sisters. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Let me ask you a question today. How are you with God? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? And by the way, it's not just giving your life to Jesus Christ only. But that's the starting point. Have you gotten to the place and point where you realize that you've been living for yourself and you want to live for God? Jesus took our place. We do not have what it takes. But praise God, He has what it takes. And all we have to do is surrender. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, today's the day. Just because you believe that's not good enough, have you stepped down from being in charge of your life? It's not my life, it's his life. If you've never done that, you're not truly a believer. A true believer has Christ first, has made a decision to put Christ first. Yes, we blow it, but we've made a decision to go for Christ first. How do you become a true believer? You must believe he exists that he died on the cross and rose again and gave your life to him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, how many would say today, so I better know how, so I know how to, <clears throat> excuse me, so I better know how to pray for you. <clears throat> would say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ for the very first time. I've never done it before. Or I want to get right. I've walked away. Can I just see a quick show of hands? Let my eyes meet your eyes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? There's four, five, six of you. Anyone else? Okay, listen, it's not the prayer. It's your heart connected to the prayer that makes a difference. I'm going to ask us all to pray this out loud if you'd be so kind. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe you died, and I believe you rose again. I ask you now to forgive me of all of my sins both known and unknown. This day, I resign from being in charge. I hand my life over to you. You are my Lord. I ask you now to fill my life. Holy Spirit, come and give me the strength to walk this path with you in Jesus name amen if you look up here real quick if you prayed that prayer today you've begun a new journey with Christ you are a believer you're secure in him if you want to just look in your worship guide there's a card or in the pocket in front of you there's a place at the bottom my decision today if you can just fill that box in I'm making a decision for Christ I'm renewing my commitment or I want to be baptized just fill that out and before we do that I want to pray for the rest of us now I want to pray that the Word of God comes alive in you. I want to pray that your passion for God becomes erupted. So, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you that if we pray anything according to your will, you will do it. Lord Jesus, 
I want to have a passion for you. I want to live for you. I want my life to matter for you. I pray you would give me more passion for you. Lord, help me to be able to read the Bible and understand it. And Father, I commit myself to you to grow, to be utilized and loved by you in Jesus' name. Open the scriptures to me. Let me know you more in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want to encourage you today.